Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place for free, which you can use right from your phone or computer. Create creation tools allows you to record and edit your broadcast so it sounds great. And they even distribute your broadcast for you so that it can be heard everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. So make sure you download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. This is FET News with Damian Anderson. Hi everyone, I'm your host, Damian Anderson, and here are your FET News for today. Baron Fred is back this week. Mr. Kwame will be back on Friday, December 27th to guest co-host with Darren Fred. There are two brand new episodes on today, so make sure you tune in. Brand new episodes comes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, so make sure you tune in. Also, make sure you follow us on all of our social media platforms on Facebook at Future Educators Talk with Damian Darren, on Twitter at Future Ed EDU Talk, and on Instagram at Future Educators Talk. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel at Future Educators Talk with Damian Darren. And make sure you hit that bell so to get notified on all new future episodes. Because if you don't, then you are certainly missing out. So that is it from me. So make sure you listen in to today's episode of Future Educators Talk. While every shelter pet is unique, some love a good game of fetch. Others would rather snuggle together on the couch. However, there is one thing that that they all have in common. They are all pure love. Right now, millions of pets in shelters and rescues across the country are waiting to be adopted. And did you know only 44% of dogs and 47% of cats in American homes come from animal shelters and rescue groups? The unique qualities of each and every shelter pet added up to incredible bond between every shelter pet and parent. So if you're thinking about getting a pet this holiday season, make sure you visit the shelterpetproject.org. This is brought to you by the Ant Council, Maddie's Fund, and the Human Human Society of the United States. Welcome to Future Education with Damian and Darren. I am your co-host, Darren Frett, and returning back the day before he the day before his final day is Mr. Quan Mr. Quan May. So welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much. Glad to be back. So how was your your Christmas? How was your Christmas? Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Darren. I uh he said that again. I could I'm having some static issues here. <laughs> what was that? How was your uh Christmas? Your Christmas Eve, your Christmas. Oh, um uh, my Christmas was great. Um just Spend a lot of quality time with my family, and you know we just enjoyed the the time together. So, uh, you know we're 
you know, we're happy to just be um, alive and healthy and to be able to complete enough to get together as a family. So we're, we're blessed. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, so, um, um, so yeah. Um, so today's topic is we're going to talk about trauma informed teaching, the how and the why. Um, that is today's topic. Um, so you used to be a teacher and can you talk a little bit about this trauma informed so um I, I can say that I mean as a teacher uh you know we we exert so much energy and passion into what we do and as a result of that Mm -hmm. we sometimes overextend ourselves because in our nature we want to go the extra mile in order to support our students because we know that in order for them to be at their best we have to be at our best And sometimes that means Mm -hmm. having to do the extra work um, beyond our job description to ensure that students are not only getting a quality education, but they're also getting the support that they need from us um, as teachers. And I think where the trauma and the stress comes in is just the fact that we have such high expectations for ourselves. You know, we're out there just Mm -hmm. trying to you know, do everything possible to not only meet the expectations of our students, but more importantly, to meet our own expectations because we we expect ourselves to perform at a high level because if we're not doing that, then our students are the ones who are victimized as a result. So I think when we talk about trauma, a lot of it, I mean, it's performance-based, But I think a lot of it, too, is the fact that we immerse ourselves in the lives of of our students. It's not about what happens just inside the classroom when they're with us. It's also about what happens when they're not with us, when they're they're at home, when when they leave us for the day and they have to go back to their respective neighborhoods where they might experience either forms of violence or some other traumatic events that could um, that can impact them in a negative way. So, I mean, it doesn't matter where we are, whether it's whether it's in the classroom or even at home. We're constantly thinking about our children, even during this holiday season. You have millions of teachers who are enjoying the time with their family, but in the back of their mind, they're thinking about the kids. They're thinking about their lesson plans, what they need to do when they get back into school. They're they're probably wondering if their children are safe and they're having a restful and peaceful Christmas. We we that's just part of our nature. We're always thinking about our students. Even now, um, you know, even though I'm I'm not in the classroom this year. I'm constantly thinking about even my former students. I have former students who are Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> we're back. 
Um, All right. We're just gonna. We're just gonna um, continue where we left off <clears throat> before oh. you had um, technical difficulties. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was saying um, just about teachers and just the trauma that we experience. Um, and I believe I was talking about like even when we're on our Christmas break, like right now. We're still thinking about our students. We're still mm-hmm. thinking about whether they're safe in their homes, whether they're safe in their neighborhoods. We're just praying that they're able to come back to us in one piece when, when school resumes um, in the new year. Cause we all, because we realize that for some of our students, it's not a guarantee that they're going to get to their homes safely. It's, you know, every day it's, mm-hmm. is a risk of their life. So we think about those um, situations and everything else. Um, mm-hmm. You can't help but feel a little bit anxious about what could potentially happen. And I think that's what causes us to, to, feel, to feel anxiety and to feel trauma because we not that we live the lives of the students but we're so immersed in their lives and we spend so much time with students that we can't help but care about them and wonder you know what's going on with them outside of school Mm -hmm. i mean even now even though i'm not in the classroom i have i have students who are either in high school Mm -hmm. or they are currently in college so these are so I have like grown students who have their own children and they're now trying to get Facebook requests from me after all these years and wow. and that um I still connect I still talk to them to this very day even though I haven't taught some of them since I don't know you know since like maybe 2011 when I was 2010 2011 when I was um in my first year of teaching now it's almost it's Bobby 2020 so a full decades past so a lot of these students are now in their early 20s and they're either finishing college or you know they've already finished college and they're about to start their own families like I have a couple of students who are married now with with um you know with young children and it's just still crazy to me because like I can remember when they were sixth graders when I have them and they were, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old, just doing what sixth graders do, you know, you know, as kids. So it's, uh, Mm -hmm. it's always great to see your kids grow up, but at the same time, you always worry about their safety and you just hope that Mm -hmm. to, um, live for a long time and not lose their lives. Like, um, other young children um, have, so it's it's hard sometimes. Yeah. Um, in the last episode, uh, where I talked about educators some more stress, I talked about where uh, you have to remember your why every time, um, like why are you doing this for? Yes. Every time you wake up in the morning. Absolutely. Every time you leave, every time you set up your classroom, every time you um, give high fives or give handshakes to your students in the morning, um, every time you leave at the end of the day. Um, and I'm pretty sure almost all the teachers are thinking about their students every time either on either on the way to home or as soon as they get home exactly that's probably like the first thing they think about is is my student is my student gonna get home safely or you know those those questions starts to pop up in their in their mind immediately no i i mean that's so true and um 
and I actually talk about this in in my first in, in my first book, Shape Teach Identity. There's a chapter that talks about determining your why. Why do you want to be an educator? What brought you into the education field? And that's what keeps me going after all these years. Even during the toughest days, I might be frustrated, you know, you know, for that night, but the very next day, I'm back in the classroom at it with my students, trying to, you know, make a difference. And and that's because I remind myself of why I'm doing this work in the first place. I knew going into this profession that there will be difficult days. I knew that from the beginning. It, mm-hmm. So when these so when those tough days happen, it doesn't come as a, as a surprise to me, as it might for some with for some other people. But you know, for me, it's it's never a surprise. It's just part of the process of developing as an educator. There's some good days and then there's some tough days. Mm-hmm. It's all about how you respond and bounce back. And I think the longer you and I think when it comes to stress and this actually speaks to the reason why we have so much teacher turnover and attrition uh, in America you can tolerate certain behaviors for so long you can manage your stress for so long but you ultimately reach a breaking point as a human and and you tell yourself at that point I don't know if I can do this anymore. It's just too much for me to bear. All of the the stress, the um, the the demands for for high performance, the workload, everything that comes along with doing this profession. I don't know if I can continue to do this any longer, and still maintain my self care as a human. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us, we 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 ultimately get to that point because we, we want to do more than just be in a classroom all day. We don't want to have to take hundreds of papers home every other night to grade into the wee hours. And you have to understand mm-hmm. that, that it gets harder, especially when you have a family. So, I mean, for myself, I started teaching when I was single. I didn't have a wife at the time. I didn't have a son at the time. It was just me. So it was easy for me to spend 50 plus hours of of doing this work without having it interfere too much with my personal life. Teaching was pretty much all I had. I had friends, but because I was so immersed into this work, a lot of my friends, I missed out on a lot of opportunities to connect with my friends and, and loved ones, which I look back on and say, you know what? I wish I could have done that differently. But, but ultimately, mm-hmm. you you know, you end up having a wife. You start to change your perspective about about the work. You're still passionate about it, but you you start you learn how to have more of a work life balance because you want to make sure that you're spending time with your wife. And that's what I had to do. I had to make some sacrifices on the professional end in order to make my, in order to make my relationship work with my wife and to make our marriage strong. And, and that was just her. Now, a few years after we get married, we have a child together. He just turned two um, a month ago. So now that's another layer of responsibility uh, for myself, you know, just being a parent now in addition to being a husband. I mean, you have to think about your child all the time. Every decision you make has to involve your child now. It's not just about me anymore. So we think about teachers who aren't getting paid the highest salaries. We think about teachers who are stressed at work and feel like they can no longer continue this line of work. You have to wonder. They can't just quit right away because they may be the breadwinners of their family. They may they may be the ones who put the food on the table and provide a roof over their Mm -hmm. children. 
So they just, so they can't just up and quit because now all of a sudden the checks stop coming and now you have to figure out what you're going to do to feed your family. What are you going to do to keep the roof over your head? What are you going to do to pay all the bills that you need to pay every month? These are all questions that circulate in our head. Mm-hmm. So when you think about the low teacher salaries, we think about the fact that there are teachers who quit this work before they finish their first year on the job. It all comes back to having that struggle to balance their lives, balance the professional life with the personal life. Um, it even took me a few years to figure that out. But ultimately, with experience and, and some wisdom, you start to figure out a way to be productive at work and not to bring a whole lot of stuff home to grade. You know, you learn that through experience and just getting stronger at your practice. Um, so, you know, that's ultimately what, uh, you know, you have to do in order to maintain your sanity as an educator in this profession. You you have to make sure that you give yourself time to, to care for yourself so you can be mm-hmm. free and fully available to your students physically and mentally when it's time. Yeah. So that's that's mm-hmm. all I'll say about that. And if you don't have time for and if you don't have time for your students, how you know how's this gonna work for you? How's this gonna work for you? So that's one of the questions that um, teachers should should ask themselves. Right. If you don't have time for, if you don't have time for, um, you mean you mean family, right? Like your children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How is it going to work for you? That's that's really the question. If I'm not be. If I'm not being able, if I'm not able to um, create time for my family, if I'm not able to create time for my son, who needs me the most at this age, I mean, this is a very critical age. These are the moments that you don't get. Once they pass, they pass. Um, so many, so many fathers who are teachers, when they go on paternity leave, they're only gone for a couple, for maybe you know two, three weeks, and then they're back in the classroom. That was something that I never understood. Because when you're a father, you have to learn so much, especially when you're a first-time father like I am. There's so many things you have to learn about being a parent. So So the thought of just being there for only two, three weeks and then going back to work how are you able to learn everything there is to know about being a first time parent to a newborn baby? It's impossible. You have to learn how to, you have to create a schedule for the baby. You have to learn how to change a diaper. You have to be mindful of what type of food you're putting into this, the child's body. Well, they don't really eat food at that point, but you have to be mindful of the milk and making sure that you make the milk ahead of time so that there's a high supply of it so I mean there's so much to think about when you're a first time um, father so to only have so to try to to, so to only be there for three weeks is just not enough time so I ended up taking three months off which is almost unheard of for men in education now women obviously will take the full 12 weeks to recover because they went through childbirth, obviously. So that's a very traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. They need time to recuperate and to heal. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for women to have the, you know, the, um, the three to four months off. But for men, we don't typically take that time off. We're so quick to get back to work 
And I just always wondered, well, we have an important role too in parenting, so we, we have to be there to to learn some of these things. So I just told myself, well, I'm gonna just take the three months off. And the only reason I was able to do that is because I had the sick and personal time available to take that much time off because I was always at school. I never took days off from from work. Mm -hmm. So as time goes on, those sick days and personal days that aren't used roll over into the next school year. And mind you, I was at the I was I was a Boston Public Schools teacher for five years, so some of these unused hours go back to my first few years in the classroom while at Boston on um, public schools. So I was able to take all the time because of the fact that I was always working. So I had the time available mm-hmm. to, to use all at once. So, I mean, that's just another thing. You know, being a parent, being married, you can't think about yourself anymore. You have to think about your loved ones. And every decision you make impacts them. It impacts them. Whether it's positive or negative, it it automatically um, impacts them as individuals. Uh, so, I mean, that's just another thing. You, you got to make sure that you're creating time for your children, especially at that young of an age where they're still learning about the world and they're soaking up so much knowledge at such a fast rate. You don't want to miss any moments. None. Mm-hmm. None. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely uh, agree with that. All you just said, I absolutely agree. Um, so, um, so we talked about the how. Um, Let's talk about the. I think we talked about the how, the how, and the why. I think we talked about the um, the why first. Yes. Um, let's talk about the how of trauma informed teaching. How? Okay. So the question is, how can teachers minimize trauma? Yes. Um, there's there are definitely a lot of strategies for us to to use in order to do that. I think for one, find a hobby outside of school. Mm-hmm. So when you're not in the classroom, find a hobby that's gonna keep you productive, but most importantly, it will keep your mind off of school. So whatever hobby you choose, it shouldn't be related to school at all. It should be something totally different from that. So for some people, it might be playing a sport. For others, it might be playing music. Mm -hmm. For some, it might be doing something that's Mm -hmm. arts and crafty. Arts and crafty. For others, it might be writing. Mm -hmm. Now, in my case, one of my favorite things to do is to sing karaoke. That's one of my pastimes. I love karaoke. You know, just being able to just sing and act crazy and and, and just be yourself for a few hours. Mm -hmm. So I, so that's something I definitely um, engage in. When I'm not in the classroom, I have my own karaoke machine, which I could play at any time. And I sing the songs that I want to sing. It's a, it's a beautiful life when you're able to do those things and and have the opportunity. Um, 
but yeah finding a hobby is one thing you, you can do another thing too is well how I mean how do we minimize trauma well I think for one we have to recognize that we can't be super we, we can't be superman or superwoman we can't mm-hmm. can't do this work by yeah, nobody expects that even though we feel as though we have to be those type of super to fully support the students in our class, ultimately, mm-hmm. that's something that we just cannot do, especially if we're talking about maintaining your self-care. I have to be willing to mm-hmm. acknowledge that. I have to give up certain things in my workload and maybe pass it on to another colleague or friend who can who can assist me. Um, so, I mean, that's something that we, we definitely have to uh, be mindful of. It's just this idea of, um, you know, just, you know, making sure that um, we are maintaining our self-care but also sharing the responsibility with our colleagues because guess what? There's a reason why you have grade level teams. Mm-hmm. The whole idea is to be able to collaborate and to work with your coworkers and colleagues who can assist you with some of the work that you may not be for whatever reason. So being so being mindful of the fact that your workload is heavy and you may need some assistance from other people within the um, work building. So that's that's two. Um, uh, the third thing, wow, the third thing I would definitely say is um, reflection. Journaling. There are people who journal every single day and reflect on their experiences in the classroom. Journaling is something that any teacher can do at any juncture of the day. You could do it in the morning. You can do it midday. You can do it on the beach. You know, you can do it, you know, before you go to bed at night. Just having that reflection about what went on in the classroom and what you, what can you do to make maybe make the lesson better or what can you do to ensure that the lesson maintains a high quality um, mm-hmm. so I would definitely say three things that um, teachers can do to you know feel empowered and to make the best choices the main thing here is to really be yourself. Um, You don't have to act like a different person. You don't have to just be yourself. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's really the main thing. And um, also, you have co-workers. You have great level teams. You have teachers on the same hallway as you. So if you feel like um, if you need help or something, go to them. Um, I, they'll be willing to help you with any questions or or you feel stressed out or anything. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, absolutely. So I think if we're able to do those three steps 
that's gonna that's gonna take us a long way. We're able to we able we'll be able to go far and and stay within the profession for a long period of time, and we're able to take some time out of our own lives to um to you know reduce the trauma and to and to really put ourselves first which sometimes for us can be hard as teachers because we're selfless by nature we're selfless people you know so that's just something that uh we have to fight through in order to um you know get the uh results that we like Now, my question is, what can we do? What can teachers do um, if a student has trauma, you know, with trauma? What can what can teachers do? Um, I think for one, just letting the student know that, hey, you know, acknowledging to the student that, you know, that you know, uh, they understand that uh, there are certain things that may be going on in their household. Because I think students want their teachers to to help them out without having to divulge too much information about what's really going on. Because you know we're in this era of you know the snitch culture where if you if you go ahead and 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 tell somebody, you know, what's going on, you could potentially put your life at risk by just reporting it to the cops or some other form of law enforcement. And some, and a lot of, you know, young black men, they don't want to take that, um, you know, they, they don't want to take that, uh, that hit. They don't want to be the ones to um, you know, be in that situation. So, I mean, I would say, I mean, to help to help students reduce their own trauma, you know, pull kids to the side, let them know that hey, you know, we we see that there's something going on, and offer your help. If there's anything that I can do to help you out and to support you and your family, please let me know. Um, I would say also just having check-ins with with the students, whether it's weekly check-ins or bi-weekly check-ins or even monthly check-ins. You want to provide, create time mm-hmm. in your schedule to just sit down and talk to the students and just get a sense of kind of what's going on at home. Um, but I think that's really the biggest thing is just getting the students to, um, you know, to see that hey, we do care, and we're and we're going to do whatever we can to support you in whatever you're doing. But at the same time, you want to hold them accountable as well. They have to know that for every action, there is a reaction, whether it be positive or negative. Um, so. You know, that's just my spill about, you know, about that. Kind of like going back to kind of uh, go, uh, get to know their story. Almost. Mm-hmm. Yes. Just getting to know their students. I mean, that's really the, the ultimate um, goal. And that could be done with questionnaires, surveys, positive calls, you know, to to their parents. I mean, there are so many ways you can engage um, students. Um, multiple ways.
Yeah, so I, I would say we have to do that. Hello? Yeah, um, most definitely. Most definitely. Um, so, um, uh, so, all right. So, um, great discussion today. Great discussion. I can call it today. Um, all right. <laughs> um, it's not going to be popcorn popping long. Um, it's going to be short today. Um, okay. So um, we'd like to thank Mr. Kwame uh, for joining on this episode today. And Monday is your last day of co- co-hosting. Um, so uh, on that day, we're going to have... Damian Anderson will be back on Monday, so he'll be joining us on Monday. Uh, on Monday's episode, we're going to talk about supporting students living in foster care. Um, this one hits home for me, so I'm going to be talking because um, I have some personal experiences living in foster mm. care. Yeah. So we're going to talk about on Monday. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the question of the day um, is we kind of we answered the question of the day but is um, it is how can I help students with trauma um, so you can answer that question by using our hashtag on future educators talk s2 and future educators talk on our social medias twitter and on instagram uh, which is on Twitter at Future Ed Talk, on Instagram at Future Educators Talk. Mm-hmm. And also, quick update uh, we are one follower away to 100 followers. So make sure you spread the word to everyone because we are only one follower away to 100 followers. So make sure you. Spread the word about our broadcast. Make sure they follow us on our social medias. Um, you can uh, follow me, Darren Fret, on my Twitter on Darren underscore Fret, and on Instagram at it's Andrew Fret. Also, um, make sure you tune in on Monday. Um, on Mr. Kwame's YouTube channel because he is doing a uh, live series, if I'm correct. Yeah, we have a, a website called um, Identity Talk for Educators Live. So on this series, we're just highlighting different educators from all parts of the world who are just doing transformational work in their communities. So, um, that's what it's all about. So be sure to tune in. Um, the episode currently are being released um, every Monday until further notice. But um, this episode is going to be a good one, especially for those who are into STEAM education. Uh, so we have a mm-hmm. we have a gentleman who's going to be talking to us about his organization. Um, called He Is Me and um, it's just a great organization that's really trying to create a pipeline for black males who are interested in getting into STEAM careers so if that's something that you're interested in we hope that you can tune in um, uh, Monday on YouTube for the new episode of I didn't talk for educators live and to learn some things about STEM education. So that's my spill. So where can um, people follow your work um, on social media? 
Well, I'm pretty much everywhere. So if it's YouTube, they can follow me on my channel, which is just my full name, Kwame Sarfo Mensa. If you type that in, you'll go, you'll be able to access my channel where you'll find all of the episodes of of my web series and the videos that I do for professional development and teaching motivation. It's all on that channel. Um, so new content, you know, always being posted in there every other day. So always be sure to tune in um, whenever you get the opportunity. Um, you can also find me on Instagram as Quam K W A M underscore the underscore identity underscore shaper um at twitter uh, my handle is at identity shaper and then um on facebook you can find me on identity talk consulting llc that's my business page for uh, my organization but you can also find me on my personal page, which is just my full name, Kwame Sarfo Mensa. And that's also the same thing for uh, my LinkedIn profile. So you can find me on all those platforms. All right. Uh, again, thank you for, thank you for joining us um, today. Oh, well, joining me today, Tammy's not here. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today um, to talk about this topic. Um, of course, everybody uh, will be back Monday. Demi will be back Monday, and then Monday will be your last day. Yes. Um, of of the year, actually. Last day, yeah. Yes, Monday will be the final. Yeah, Monday will be the final episode of the decade. So you might want to tune in on that day. Um, without further ado, um, I am Darren Frett, and he's Mr. Kwame Sofo Mensa. Yes. If I pronounced it correctly. That was very <laughs> Yes. Uh, so this is Future Educators Talk with Damon and Darren. I will see y'all on Monday. So have a fantastic Friday. All right. <laughs>